Again, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Don P. Giddens inaugural professorial lecture series. Uh, it is truly my pleasure to be here this afternoon with you to honor Pam Sheff, the director of the Center for Leadership Education, as well as the Masters of Science and Engineering Management program. Pam is known for developing project-based curricula that brings industry into the classroom and involves students in active learning with industry leaders. An award-winning writer and marketing communications consultant, Pan has developed marketing, public relations, and communication strategies for clients ranging from startups to large corporate, institutional, and government organizations. She founded Chef and Lano Communications and was one of the founding members of the Prison Education Partnership an organization devoted to providing college education to incarcerated men and women. She was also previously uh, director of the writing program at Goucher College and served for three years as a public affairs and editorial director at WMAR-TV. This afternoon, we'll hear about how Pam has been integral in bringing engineers into the Johns Hopkins hospitals at both the East Baltimore campus and Johns Hopkins Bayview. In 2016, the Center for Leadership Education collaborated with the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research to form the Patient Safety Collaborative, a student consulting program where Masters of Engineering Management students work with Johns Hospital hosts. And through this partnership, students learn about real world challenges faced by the hospitals and work closely with clinicians to innovate engineering solutions to improve patient safety. I'd like at this moment to uh, take a moment to recognize one of my predecessors, Don Giddens, for whom this inaugural professorial lecture series is named. Don Giddens was the fifth Dean of Engineering at Johns Hopkins and a professor of mechanical engineering. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Ed Scheinerman, not to be confused with Ed Schlesinger. He's professor, of, uh, professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics and Vice Dean for Faculty in the Whiting School of Engineering. Ed. Thank you, Ed. It is my pleasure to introduce today's honoree, Professor Pam Sheff, Director of our Center for Leadership Education, the CLE. Pam joined our faculty a while back as lecturer. Then she was promoted to senior lecturer and then to associate teaching professor. And now we are here to celebrate her promotion to teaching professor. When we think about promotion, the attributes we are looking for in a candidate begin with the letter I. Words like innovative, insightful, important, impactful, influential. All of these are apt descriptors of you, Pam. I want to focus on the word influential, especially in the context of a school of engineering and the role of the CLE therein. So let me tell you a story. Engineers want to change the world and improve the human condition. A century ago, the refrigerator in your kitchen could kill you if it leaked ammonia. To fix this, a new class of non-toxic refrigerants were developed, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs for short. Those CFCs were not only in every refrigerator, but in a host of other applications, including as propellants in cans of hairspray, shaving cream, or cheese whiz. As we know, those CFCs wrecked havoc on the ozone in the upper atmosphere and weakened its ability to protect people from harmful UV rays. Today, you don't hear much about the ozone hole because it's well on its way to healing. And here I get to my point. This success was a partnership between engineering and influence. It was not enough to develop new refrigerants. The path to this positive outcome also required exactly the kind of skills our Center for Leadership Education instills in our students, influence through impactful communication and insightful analysis. Pam, under your leadership, the CLE has transformed from a focused entrepreneurship to a deeper mission that enables our students to transform engineering innovation into important, impactful action for a better world. As such, CLE has become a model that other universities aspire to copy. You have also led your center through amazing growth, innovation, and independence while preserving a warm collegial culture. 
Congratulations on your promotion. We look forward to hearing your presentation, bringing engineers into the Johns Hopkins Hospitals collaborations to improve patient safety. Pam. Thank you. All right, now I have to get my glasses because uh, without that I would not be able to see a thing. So thank you, Ed. Thank you, Dean Schlesinger. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to talk with all of you today. It is, it is truly a thrill to look out and see all of you. And I'm especially glad that my wonderful family could be here to share this moment. My husband, Ron, who's been the most caring and supportive partner anyone could ever ask for. My children, Jen and Ben, John and Zoe and Allison, just they inspire me every day. And I'm especially thrilled that three of my grandchildren could be here, Caroline, Annie, and Chloe. It, it's very special for me. So I have had a long and very happy career, several careers really, and uh, I fortunately still consider myself in medias race. The length of my professional life means that I have had many mentors. Some are gone, some are in this room today, and one could not be with us because he has the happy chore of taking his twins to visit college, and that is Tim Weiss. Tim was CLE director before me, and he was a great mentor for me. You know, he, he worked, we worked closely together. He encouraged me to lead CLE, and he championed the idea that CLE could be run by its teaching track faculty. And for that, I am eternally grateful. This is the best job I have ever had. And for that, I owe my wonderful faculty and my wonderful students a huge thank. Thanks, and Dean Schlesinger, who has been unfailing, su unfailingly supportive and a wonderful leader himself that, that I consider a mentor. So I'm just uh, very, very glad to be among you today. The story I'm gonna tell you is about the hospital project. And let's see, where are my slides? Okay, so. Okay. And I want to tell you about a remarkable young woman who helped me start this pro project that has become one of the signature parts of MSEM. And for those of you who do not, are for, unfamiliar with the Master of Science in Engineering Management program, or MSEM as we call it, it is a program that is jointly run by CLE and our engineering partners in the Whiting School. CLE runs the program and delivers the management side, and our engineering departments deliver the technical tracks. Uh, in the world of engineering management, we are unique because most programs do not offer technical tracks, and people come from all over the world because they want this very special blend that we offer. So, our goal is to turn these talented engineers who come to us from all over the world into, into leaders who can enter the workplace with the skills to make an impact and solve crucial problems. The project I'm gonna talk about is one of the key tools in our management toolbox. Let's see, okay. Well, are we, there we go, okay. Okay, officially titled the Patient Safety Collaborative, the project is known to M. Semmers simply as the hospital project, and it occupies the first seven to eight weeks of all M. Sem students' first semester. And we have a room full of hospital project veterans with us today, right? The project formally launched, as Dean Schlesinger said, in 2016 as a seven-week student consulting program facilitated by the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research, the ITCR, in collaboration with CLE. The gist of it is that small, multidisciplinary MSEM teams work with Johns Hopkins Hospital hosts to understand clinical issues faced by the hospital every day. We're not trying to turn them into healthcare consultants, although some people do develop a taste for it and go on to a career in healthcare consulting. We're showing them how to translate their engineering mindsets, the problem-solving skills they've developed 
in many ways over many years into pro the problem solving skills they're gonna need and translate this into other challenges. Students learn about real world costs measured in time, money and lives involved in keeping patients safe. And they develop innovative solutions to save time, money and often lives. In the process, they learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. But long before 2016, the germ of the project began to grow in a classroom at Goucher College. As I thought about leaving my consulting practice, I had begun to teach professional communications classes at Goucher part-time to see if I was ready to return to academia. In 2003, I was teaching that class and one of my students was an inquisitive, enthusiastic young woman named Laura Camerata. She happened to be exactly the same age as my youngest daughter, Allison. And I thought that if they were at the same school, they could be friends. Laura's the one on your right over there, and Allison is on the left. Laura was a rock star in class. But even more than that, she fully engaged in the work we were doing. She loved working on projects, and she had a knack for making teams go. In short, she was a natural collaborator, and we struck up a relationship. She adopted me as a mentor, hung around the office, and she served as my course assistant when I decided to join Goucher full time. As luck would have it, my daughter Allison decided to transfer to Goucher, and they indeed became best friends and roommates. When Allison and Laura graduated from Goucher in 2006, and I left to join CLE, Laura and I made it a goal to find a way to work together again. The opportunity arose 10 years later when Laura, who had decided to pursue a career in public health and was working towards her MPH, got a job at the ITCR. They had a grant to work on patient safety issues, and I was then directing MSEM. Laura called me up with an idea. Why not pair engineers with clinicians to take a fresh look at some of the more intractable problems associated with safety? To give you a sense of the project, I'd like to play you a video we made a couple of years into the hospital project. You're going to see that it stops, which means that at this moment, for whatever reason, Dr. Phelps is not breathing. So if we have a patient that we go onto the floor that's in a respiratory rest, and I don't see any waveform like that, what that's telling us again is that at this He's moment, this patient isn't breathing. Hopkins is home to one of the strongest engineering departments in the world, but engineers need problems to solve. Healthcare is one of the biggest arenas for engineers because there are so many issues where engineering thinking can make a big difference. Locating the pumps, dead batteries, sensors that are off, all that kind of stuff. The Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety was looking for uh, engineers to work on a list of patient safety problems with our clinicians. The Whiting School of Engineering had also expressed interest to us in working more with uh, School of Medicine. And we brought the two groups together to uh, come up with uh, real, impactful, translatable solutions to things that are facing our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. The bed alarm was going off like every three minutes. Like every three minutes. This is a really important concept that fresh eyes and different perspective can make a really big impact on solving problems and also thinking of the problem in the first place. Because they've been looking at one single thing for 15 years, 20 years, they probably will not realize that there are defects in it because they're used to it. A lot of people think uh, when they hear engineering students uh, writing computer code or software. What was really interesting about this group was um, as Masters of Science and Engineering Management students, they came from all different backgrounds. And what really made them tick was looking at systems and what contributes to a system. So we had them do ethnography research, which is really looking at the anatomy of a problem. So analyzing the system the problem is happening in to figure out what contributed to that problem. Initially, we're looking at how we can improve the technology, um, but we sort of like shifted our focus to how we can improve the human aspects of that. Um, of that relationship. You've got to understand why they think what they think. The first couple of weeks were definitely a learning curve. I had never even worked in a hospital before. We were like those children, you know, going around asking everyone questions. It wasn't just academic, it was real life, which is amazing. Cut, you know, for oh. cardiac, As a teacher, I had some concerns about how the clinicians would respond to these young engineers. 
and I was thrilled that my students delivered, they recognized the opportunity okay, so they the had, and the clinicians were outstanding mentors. How many we found that the units we observed were actually really open to our observations. It's one thing to let engineers, you know, observe and tell them what's wrong, but it's another thing to actually implement those solutions. Some of the students are continuing to work with their hosts. Um, to take those pr uh, proposed solutions into action in the hospital. I was amazed by the amount, the, the, the quality of the thinking, the depth of the uh, questions that the students asked, and the professional and um, extremely useful uh, uh, reports that they generated for their clinical hosts. The engineering students gained confidence, skills, problem solving, and all in a situation where they felt like their work mattered. The clinical hosts got a free, valuable perspective in these students that they would normally have to pay a consultant for. What's really great about collaboration in general is that nobody can do, nobody can do it all. Especially in clinical research, if you collaborate, you're going to get more perspective. Bringing all these perspectives together results in better patient outcomes. When that last scene was filmed, um, one of the speakers there, Jackie Choi, who, who talked uh, about how amazing the experience was, when she gave her presentation, she had forgotten to wear shoes. I can't explain why she forgot to wear shoes that day, but <laughs> she realized that she probably shouldn't get up in the front of the room without shoes, so I gave her mine. So while she, while she was presenting, she was wearing my shoes and I was barefoot. <laughs> But we joke with the students that for everyone whose parents always wanted them to be doctors, this is their opportunity to take pictures in scrubs and send those pictures home. So <laughs> after their projects, many, let's see if this will move now. There we go. After their projects, many teams have been invited back to present on grand rounds and to hospital management committees and conferences. Everyone who has participated in the hospital project has had the opportunity to make a difference, and so many people in this room will tell you that was the case. Students have worked on issues ranging from keeping surgical patients from eloping from the hospital without their prescriptions or with medical equipment, to figuring out why instrument counts post-surgery sometimes fail to match the ones. Pre-surgery, they have worked on fall prevention, airflow issues in ORs, and preventing sepsis. I almost rejected a project one year because it seemed so mundane, and it turned out to be one of our most perplexing problems. Why did nearly invisible perforations keep appearing in some of the sterile wrap covering packages intended for the OR? This was a major issue because the perforations rendered the equipment's inside unusable until re-sterilized leading to delays in surgery, backups in the OR, and extra costs. Like everyone else, I assumed at first that the rat must be defective in some way. But why would that be the case only for certain units? Why would some units suddenly start to have perforations when they had not in the past? Our engineers carefully observed the wrapping process from start to finish, and they talked to everybody, from the manufacturer to the wrappers to the transporters to the end users. They took apart carts delivering the packages. No success. They could find no issues. Only when they decided to look at how the wrapped packages were stored in every unit, and they went through every single unit, the, did they discover that some storerooms used what metal wire shelving that occasionally had rough edges. Removing the packages from the shelves meant dragging them across the grates, resulting in the perforations. And when a storeroom that didn't start with wire shelves got too crowded, people added the wire shelves when they needed more room. Packages stored on flat shelves arrived in the OR intact a simple solution to an expensive project. Other projects involved the students in more political with a small p problems. Assigning responsibility for managing diabetic patients' insulin pumps during surgery sounds straightforward, but wasn't. 
Several departments claimed medical ownership of the issue, but no one department actually wanted to be on call to come to the OR every time a diabetic patient had surgery. And no one, anesthesiology included, wanted to turn pump management over to an anesthesiologist. Clearly, this was not a medical problem. Our students ultimately realized that the issue had to be resolved not by individual units, but by engaging the leaders who could create hospital-wide policy. In this case, coming to understand who could solve the problem was as important as creating the solution itself. Laura Camerata eventually moved on to epidemiology away from the ITCR, and the project has evolved away from the ITCR as well. The amazing Stacy Marks, who's sitting right here in the audience with us, started working with us when she was at the ITCR, and she is now at Whiting. And we are very grateful for that, and she's just agreed to take on a larger role with the, with the project. We're currently thinking about other, working with other partners at the hospital as well. Okay. We are also working on a new project with Johns Hopkins Bayview that is really an outgrowth of the hospital project. One of our longtime partners, Dr. Renee Blanding, who's vice president of Bayview, and her president, Jennifer Nichols, reached out to us because they wanted to get Whiting engineers involved in their work on a more permanent basis. And amazingly, they have funding. <laughs> They're particularly interested in finding ways to incorporate AI productively in medicine as well as in their management processes. Paulette Clancy and I are working on a proposal through DSAI to create a number of six-month and summer internships for Whiting grad students at Bayview. I'm confident that this is just the beginning for the kinds of collaborations we can create. I've talked so far primarily about the value of the hospital project to our clinical partners. But why do we do it in MSEM, and why has it become such a cornerstone of the program? We throw students into this project. Oh, back. There we go. We throw students into this project on the second day of boot camp in August. And many of the people in the room today can tell you how confusing that is. <laughs> Many of them have only been in the country for a week or two. None of them have experience in healthcare. And suddenly, doctors are confiding their problems to them and taking them very seriously. It's a mind blowing and totally confusing experience. And that's just what we want. We give them the management tools and mentor them through the process in the classroom and in team meetings. They have to use everything they ever learned about engineering, but in different ways. They have to create functional teams and trusting relationships. They have to gently disabuse their partners of mistaken assumptions and learn to talk to and listen to all kinds of people to understand their problems. It's difficult, it's very frustrating, but in the space of seven weeks, students are transformed in ways that will take them weeks longer to realize. One of my students, Brene Karkley recently told me about this experience, his experience on the hospital project. And Brene is sitting right here, along with his teammates, Abish Katsoni, Ria Jadov, and Yu Hang Wang. They worked on optimizing the scheduling of operating rooms and the process of reporting on room usage. I asked him what his primary takeaway was. He immediately cited the importance of developing a clear problem statement. Here's what he said. Our host's initial project description reflected many biases that we had to strip away in order to see the problem clearly. We spent four and a half weeks defining the problem statement, but once we had that, we developed the solution in one night. Their hosts were pleased and frankly amazed by the team's insights and the new processes the team proposed. For a team to be able to move from complete confusion to problem identification to problem solution is an invaluable experience. And to do that while building the team itself and learning how to sustain functional teamwork, that's a remarkable achievement. I can tell people how to do it. And they read the course materials. But until they have gone through the experience, they have no idea what they can actually accomplish in the real world. The solutions are never perfect. No solution is. But the students never fail to come up with ideas based in research and data 
ideas that are workable and worth considering, ideas that lead to other ideas. That's the most important takeaway. Even if they don't realize it at the time, every student emerges from the hospital project with confidence that they can make sense out of chaos, work on a multidisciplinary team, and talk to anyone. What about the faculty? What do we take away besides relief that we have managed once again to make all the moving pieces fit together? For me, it is the joy of watching the transformation in my students and the challenge of reflection. What could we do differently? What can we do better? How can we better the experience for the next cohort? For me, the hospital project never gets old. And every time we embark on a new semester, I think of Laura Camerata and how we started the project. And now for the hard part. So I don't have a happy ending here. When I decided to speak today about the hospital project, I intended to honor my good friend, Laura, and very much hoped that she would be able to be here in person today. That is not the case, however. My remarkable, always curious, brave, always enthusiastic friend, Laura, is gravely ill. You can see in the picture here, that's her birthday. She just turned 40, and she has a six-month-old baby. We promised each other we would do something great together, and I believe that we have. Each improvement in patient outcomes and each MSEM engineer who thrives in the hospital project is a product of Laura's vision and the relationship we forged in that long ago Goucher classroom. That's the takeaway I will always keep with me. And so this is for you, Laura. Thank you for everything. Thank you all. Stay there. sharing uh, this uh, journey with us today. And congratulations on your uh, IPL and, Thank your, you. and your appointment as, prof as teaching professor. We do have a small um, souvenir of the day for you. Yes, so that's for you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us, for being with us, and please uh, join us for refreshments and a little mingling here at the back of the room.